Bob and Lydia. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm self. <laughs> okay, this is a panel on um, the works of Milton Klingerman. Uh, one of, just to get it out of the way, we all introduce ourselves. Okay, uh, I'm Brett Cox. I am a uh, English professor at Norwich University in Vermont. I also write fiction and uh, occasionally uh, criticism. I've got short stories um, in all sorts of places. Uh, I'm Robert Kilhepper. Um, which is viewable on here that is misspelled. Please, everybody, fix every reference to it in your uh, program book. I want L's and F's where it's supposed to be. Um, oh, sure. Okay. Also, I mean, anything you find on there, I want another. I need F another one here. They're they were, they were, they were running short. short. They're running short. Yeah. Okay, guys, so anything I write is, is under F. Brett Cox. <laughs> for what that's worth. <laughs> Um, I'm a, a long-time um, reviewer and writer of criticism, as well as I was the editor of um, Century Magazine, and I worked for a long time on the New York Review of Science Fiction with Gordon here, and, um, and I've been coming to these things for uh, 25 years. 25 years. Yeah. And I'm a little fan of it. And that's it. Your host for this panel, Gordon Van Gelder. I'm the former editor and current publisher of Fantasy and Science Fiction. And I'm pretty sure they put me in charge of this panel because I edit FNSF, which is where Mildred Klingerman published most of her fiction. Uh, <coughs> so even though she got she died in the 70s, I believe. She died in the 70s. She stopped publishing. You know, I, I, I never had any direct contact with her. I am, through osmosis, a, a connection, you know, um, since I was editing the magazine where she published. <coughs> um, most of her work is collected, appears in just one volume, most of her published work. Um, I can tell you, though, she was last year, was it last year's winner of the Court Winner Smith Award? Yeah. She won recently. <clears throat> and uh, in the process of which I did talk with her grandson, Mark Bradley, who's a chef in Texas, I think. And he told me <clears throat> that although she didn't publish that much fiction after the 60s, she was always writing and doing things. And I think he said she would write crossword puzzles and get them published. Um, and was always doing, like, I know he said long uh, family letters about trips and things like that. So we have, unfortunately don't have a lot of other published work by her beyond the stuff that's in a couple of space. But she was an inveterate writer. Uh, and one of the reasons he contacted me was because he wanted to know about uh, things about rights and commissions. And I think that he's, that he, Simply implied that he and his family are looking to publish, you know, bring their work back into print. So I have to follow up with him about that, but there could there could yet be more Mildred Clinger and stuff in the closet somewhere. At the moment, though, we, what we have is did either did any in addition to the stories in this book, I think she had three later yeah, stories in that set. Brett brought the were those the seventies ones. No, the, well, it's not the there was one in nineteen. Six so for the October 1962, and then two published in 1975, and that's it. And it was just a happy coincidence because my collection of fantasy and science fiction dates from the 1970s, but I just by sheer chance had picked up uh, a copy of the issue that had her later 1962. But if you're looking for the collective works of Mildred Klingerman, you're talking about story, a short story in each of these three magazines and everything in this book, and that's pretty much it. We're talking about 19... I think there's one other story that we know from Ladies Home Journal or Collier's. Yeah, there, well, there were some... Um, that printed again. It got, got printed. All of the ones that were in the women's magazine, according to my 
sources here. We, we, we probably we'll, use the same we'll probably <laughs> use the same thing, yeah. Well, like the story Winning Recipe was published in Collier's First Lesson in Collier's The Little Witch of Elm Street, Women's Home Companion. Uh, all three of those were reprinted in that right. kind of stuff. Um, and then made into a And then made space. into a cup full of space. And there were also two stories that were original to a cup full of space, A Red Heart and Blue Roses and The Gay Deceiver. And a red heart of the roses was reprinted at that NASA. So it's all, you know, as I said. So basically, and I got confused because there was something, uh, I found a listing for a story called The Watcher in the Dream, published in Ellery Creedence Mystery Magazine in 1964. But then I found another source that said that that is the story, um, first lesson. And it just got retitled and re reprinted. Yeah. There. So again, you know, we're talking about about twenty about twenty stories. If there's one thing in this world I know how to do, it's look stuff. <laughs> so, uh, so, um, is, so anyway, is the book likely to be available in the dealer's room? Um, I don't know. I got this. I have owned this book for approximately two and a half weeks uh, because when I knew I was going to be on this panel, I need clearance for it just it's sort of in passing and thought it would be an interesting opportunity. So I got this on eight books. A certain eight books. ABC books. ABC books. ABC books. Um, it's a very, very good online dealer, and I think this was from some. some I think this came from some uh, store. Yeah, yeah, they're they're. When I looked, there are maybe 10 copies available on there, going prices, mostly like seven or eight dollars. Um, the dealers room here, it seems like over the years they carry less and less older stuff. Yep. So it's probably just going to be a random, someone you know, might have noticed there was a panel on there, so they might have decided to bring their copy. Right. Yeah. You know, David Hartmuller and Daryl Schweitzer might have a copy on their table, but there's yeah. no guarantees. Right. You know, you know, these books. But, but they, are, they, seem like they are available and you can get them for what I would say are not collector's prices necessarily. I mean, it's not going to be 35 cents, which is the cover price, but it's not going to be $50. Right. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're, the near fine copy will go for like 15 or $20. Yeah. Like that, so. yeah. so it's so. Not, terrib not terribly hard to get yet. Um, and oh. Yeah. And it has a cool, a cool uh, classic version. It has a very good power to Richard Powers was a well-known illustrator of the day, and um, I grew up, he was one of the artists that imprinted me in my studies, uh, it's a very striking point. I, I don't want to start a false rumor, but I know I was looking, you know, I inherited the FNSF files, which don't include editorial files, but it does include uh, contracts and such. And I know I was looking at somebody's file recently, and found that it was one of the rare cases where the magazine had bought a story and then chose not to publish it and spike the story. And I'm pretty sure it was by her. Uh, I know it, it was a Christmas story from about 1962, and I don't know anything else about it at this point. Oh, what was, oh, from 62, because the story in here, the wild, right, that's a Christmas right. story. No, that's this, was, this was something else, and I, I don't want to say this was, that it was definitely a Klingerman story. So I don't remember whose card I was looking at in the files. But I, I will go back and check and see if I can track this down. So there may be another unpublished story out there. Or, or it may be somewhere, somewhere in Berlin's files of unpublished stories that the magazine bought. So I'm curious just to know, like, the people here have mostly have read Klingerman? Or are they yeah. here to be curious? OK, so only a few. Um, OK, so yeah. I'm trying not to spoil it's too much that I guess in talking about the stories though. Well, I don't know. It, it's it's yeah. tough because it's, well you guys want to it just for starting here. <coughs> since we're talking about a complete body or mostly complete body of work it's about like, 14 stories. Yeah, yeah, Total about 20 after the ones that yeah, yeah. Yeah. later ones. But in this book I think there's 16 or 15 or 16. But I think we I, I can certainly feel comfortable generalizing about them and saying that they're almost all new little character portraits. Um, connected to a story that hinges on usually a fantasy element, but often with a surprise yeah. element to it. Mm -hmm. so twists. Mm -hmm. You know, very much in the old Twilight Zone thing. Uh, and some of these would have made great Twilight Zone episodes, I think. Yeah. Um, but, or, 
early, you know, Shirley Jackson is a better comparison. That kind of short fiction that was very common in the 50s and still common today about like said, re stories really hinging on one fantastic twist. And so it, it, we, we don't, it's tough to avoid spoilers in some of these. You can have, yeah, you're almost not describing the story at all without explaining the twist because it's about the only thing that's really of a plot nature in it. But it, it, what makes them more than that, at least the best ones, are the character elements. And that seems to have been, to me, like what she was most interested in. Yeah. She'd kind of come up with a little a little twist, but then she'd spend the whole story. Sometimes you kind of already know the twist within the first couple paragraphs. Yeah. It's no secret. And the rest of it is just is, is her um, using it to let her, you know, to give her a reason to, to talk about the characters and stuff. Well, I, I thought it was more integrated. It's one of, one of the things I like about this stuff is that it, they are all character-driven stories. I, I think every one of them. But I don't feel like in any case that does the character overwhelm the story. Oh yeah, not at all. Not at all. It, I found them very tightly constructed, right. very well balanced in that regard. Yeah, I just meant that you don't you don't feel like once you get the twist, it's over. You should just stop. It. It's not there. Right. Both things are there and working. So even though in many cases uh, she would be. She probably didn't even expect it to be a surprise by the end. That's just what drives the action. Um, but yeah, they're very satisfying. They're very easily constructed. They're um, surprisingly that way. I'm not, I don't know a lot about, I don't know if anybody knows a lot about where she came from. But she kind of shows up with the Minister of That Portfolio, right? and, and I think she publishes three stories in 52. You know, that mess up, right? Nobody brought up the movie here. No, uh, I, I don't. I, I, I went to look <clears throat> that here's a heat moment. I, I saw I remember, I saw a reference to that, and I said, "Oh, I've got that." And so after going through uh, where the paperbacks are, I no, I don't have this. How is that possible? I, I do, and I forgot to say it, but I know that Belcher talks in there about his first introduction to Mrs. Langerman, that her agent, who I think was Wallace Wing. Uh, basically said, <clears throat> we've got this really neat, I think, I think there was some attractive term in there, used in there, um, woman that we really think about, we really want you to meet, we think you're going to love her. And Belcher replied, well, sounds great, but what about her fiction? <laughs> and of course he wound well, up. But then he seems like to like it. Oh, he loved it. I mean, he loved it. Yeah. The stories are, are very interesting, uh, both in themselves and in context, because as Gordon said, there was a lot of this sort of thing being published in the 1950s, and there was a lot of this sort of thing being published by women writers. Uh, there were, uh, Klingerman is in the context of not only uh, really Shirley Jackson, but uh, early work by Carol Demischwiller, by Judith Merrill. In fact, I've got to put on my academics hat. I will point your attention to uh, an academic book by Lisa Gass, uh, Gassett called Galactic Suburbia Recovering Women's Science Fiction that does mention Klingerman in here. In fact, there's a pretty detailed discussion in here of the story Mr. Sacrison's Halt, which is a kind of uh, really twilight zone. Right. So that's is that's that's civil rights movement. Right, that's the one about the uh, young woman who gets on the train with the older lady, mm -hmm. and the older lady had been engaged to someone who got off that same train at a stop that seems to have disappeared. Uh, you know, it's in the south, and the stop, she the only she remembered about it is that it was a surprisingly integrated place. It was a scene of peaceful park scene out there, you can see, where all the different colored people were meeting together. And, and he seemed to meet somebody he knew or knew him, and the train left before she could get off. And the person who I met was, uh, based on the description of the story, an African-American. And her hesitancy at that was what caused right. her to lose him. She has a moment of, of the kind of reflexive Southern anger. Yeah. And she sees him suddenly like as just a Yankee, she says yeah. the story. Right. And that's why she doesn't get off. And she spent the next 30 years riding a train a couple, a couple times a week, hoping to find this stop again. And then at the end of the story, it's the typical kind of twist, of course, 
you know, she will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that actually leads to one thing that I was a little surprised by when I was reading through Plan And it's very rewarding to have um, a set brief body of work. And you read, you know, 19 stories and, okay, here's my... Klingman's work because I think well, the program description was talking about the darkness of the stories and comparing them to Shirley Jackson and in particular uh, the threat, the male threat, and that, you know that, that's there. But it, with a couple, this is kind of globally spoilery, but but the with a couple of exceptions, the stories usually resolve in some level of positive yeah. nature that, 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 you know, the wound is healed, the protagonist uh, eventually, after much trial and tribulation, gets what he or she wants. In some of the shorter, more verbal comic stories, um, you know, they, they, the woman almost inevitably is able to one-up whatever force, usually male, it is against her. The other thing is that despite the presence of the male threat, and there are two of the best stories in here are fundamentally about rape. Uh, the, um, the, I think we can talk about that later, but um, the, but the also she presents women characters and married suburban women characters who are unapologetically comfortable with their own sexual uh, and I found that very interesting. It's not, you know, that, uh, that sexuality is, can be an oppressive and even violent force, but it doesn't have to be. And there are two, two or, you know, several instances in here of a, of a wife kind of, you know, there's suddenly she'll, you know, inform the reader just how hot she is for her husband. And, and, and I found that. Because uh, I one uh, senior part of the film. Yeah, or some kind of one that, yeah, that, that has that. Right. The, the protagonist is hung over, right? From right. Party. right. That's yeah. very fun. That, that's and you go back fun. to the, in the counting center of the party, she summarizes the conversation as being, well, we talked for a while about architecture and sex, and right. the news and sex, politics and sex. And this is her summary of the thing, of the, and at the end, everyone resolved that they were in favor of this, that's whatever, sense. and sex. And so it is kind of interesting to find that this was a great little line that you toss away in there about uh, they were speaking of something else and how it would look laid out and it in the meeting of course then the subject turned back to sex. Yes. No, so it's, it's not even just in the context of, of sort of marriage. It's that there's a generalized comfort with it that is very, I'm saying it's, it's, it's just there. It's not, she doesn't make a big deal out of it, and that's almost what makes it more interesting, is that she feels so comfortable just writing that description and thinking, this is no, you know, it's, she knows it's funny, but and she doesn't course, think she's doing anything transgressive. And, and of course, based on what little biographical information there is, she married very young and stayed married until she died. Yeah, that, was, that, was, that I can, well, her grandson, Mark, did verify they were, she was married to Stuart Klingerman for 50 plus years. Uh, I don't know how many kids they had, but he's, he's a grandson. Right. Until they died, they had, or, uh, no, until she died. You know, no, really, they would have been 60 years then. Yeah, or because uh, yeah. they married in 30. He said, he said 50 plus. But basically, yeah, plus. Plus. Yeah. her entire life. Yeah. Um, well, there, there was, and they married in <coughs> 19 or something. Yeah, but he's also the source of the information that <coughs> was in the uh, program and I see on the internet that uh, she stopped writing mostly at the behest of her husband. Mark told me that there was an eternal source of friction in their marriage, that he didn't think a wife, that his wife should have to work. And she was always doing these stories, and he felt like, in a, you know, an old school gentleman sort of way, that it wasn't dignified for her to be writing these, these fantasy stories. He was always trying to get her to knock it off. And she was still doing it. And he said, it, you know, they just kept sort of uh, butting heads over it until she finally gave up and stopped sending stories out. Whether or not she stopped writing them, I'm not sure, but... The yeah, that's, and that, that, that dynamic shows up in at least half the stories very explicitly in a, a, a marriage where the husband, in one case, it's inverted as the wife who is exerting all this pressure on her partner. Oh, we always thought about to be, to be um, with the, 
It's the, 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 the little bitch. Yeah. The little bitch has the, the couple that is where the wife is the one who's in charge and is just dictating how life will be and squashing the spirit right. of our spouse. Just insisting everything has to be in its proper place. Super neat. Yeah. Crazily yeah. neat. And so it, that's why it was published in that Women's Home Companion. So it, it has all these elements of housekeeping tension um, around the story is also about this little girl who may or may not be possessed. And, and it's, uh, but this, that dynamic, it seems like, comes right out of her, what we know about her life. And you can imagine if her husband ever read any stories, he might have been more uncomfortable about her. Oh, yeah. that, that was, did he say that whether or not her husband actually read it? He didn't say, okay. So we had yes. to so there, there was no, no secret in these things about how she felt. See, I, 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 get, I get that from the stories, but I also look at the stories, and I, I think I don't see them that way because I see them as being so, such astute portraits of women mm -hmm. that I don't think she was writing about herself. You know, not always. Yeah. You know, to the extent you're always writing about yourself at a certain level, but I think she was writing about the people that she knew and saw, mm -hmm. and she was doing those these neat little portraits. There's the one of I think it's the red heart of the woman. You know, the two women in the hospital, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> and. Uh, I just think the character portraits over and over show the women are so diverse and well observed that I just don't think the author was writing to try to express herself so much as she was trying to capture, you know, photography is another thing that I was doing here. And I think she was, you know, almost like a lens snapping photographs of these other women that she got that she could meet and get to know. And that's how it means to be in the Yeah, no, I think. Um, um, uh, I'll be a bit more bold for myself early a little here. I, um, yeah, I think I think Gordon's right. There, there, these are remarkably obscurely observational stories, and I would add that I think she was very, very skilled at portraying children and in looking into the inner life. There's one sentence, and I can't immediately locate it in um, the story. The um, uh, it, it was the one about the, um, the uh, where they're having the, the picnic in the graveyard and um, yeah, yeah. Um, the day of not the day of the a day for waving. Yeah, where she is just suddenly, you know, the and that's a story that starts very darkly and ends all with more of a sense of, of, of ends on kind of grace, a moment of grace. Oh, oh yeah, that's what's a little portrait of, of the grief process and it really works as well as being a kind of story. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the children are little I think so. I have no question that she's doing that. It was the repetitive quality of this one, which of course is based on the time. Right. She may have observed lots of people who were in this kind of relationship. Um, but we you know a little bit about her life, I wonder what she's doing. I'm sure it's very possible. But certainly uh, the characters themselves are, are, are very she doesn't reproduce the characters so much as the situation is the one that it comes out repeatedly. Um, but it was interesting to see that in the Little Witch that she was even ahead in the first, even in the case where she was um, portraying two groups of people. Uh, she found one that was where the, the husband happened to be in this squeezed position. Right. And, um, and so it comes through all the time, but it's what she just felt from around her or felt herself, this sense of being kind of squashed and unable to be um, it's in that it's in that story say for waving the way she describes jealousy is feeling like you're she the, the little kid thinks of the jealousy she feels like like you're squeezing a baby chick. Yeah. It's weird. But the squeezing thing seems to be all up through a lot of these things, the sense of being in the minister without portfolio so story, it's an older woman whose widow has gone to live with her son and okay. daughter-in-law, and he won't, and she won't. The daughter-in-law won't make any room for her. Says right. she doesn't want her to mess around. Right. She doesn't want to do anything with the kids. Sends her off to go right. with some right. to her hat, too, right? and yeah. she yeah. makes sure this one hat she doesn't like. And she just feels so unable to have a have a express herself or be you know have a place for herself in the world. Then. And that's what's happening in a lot of these marriages where there's, she repeats this sense of how would I explain myself. Mm -hmm. to so-and-so. How could I explain myself to my husband about 
I said, okay, tell them about these dreams I'm having. Right, and that I that I'm willing to that I would identify as something that emerges from probably from their personal experience or even something like the story of the of the day of the green velvet cloak, which is one of the most overtly kind of well well made romantic stories in there, and it, it centers in a bookshop and. It centers around it's sort of a curiosity, curiosity shop type yeah. story, and, and it's a, one of the things that I saw said that she was very she was the woman was herself a book collector, especially books by and about Kenneth Graham and mm -hmm. of Victorian travel journals. Now, also before we leave the or you know, the uh, for her return in the seventies, I want to know what happened in the mid seventies that suddenly she because it was thirteen was years between the yeah. one and the next. I but I do know that she. Did teach at the University of Arizona mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's possible that she's in the process of teaching. She got uh, started writing and submitting again. Mm -hmm. but that's just a guess. Um, but uh, it, the blurb by Ed Furman's blurb in, for the story of the time before is: uh, Here's the first new story of more than ten years from Elder Klingerman, who contributed regularly to SSF during the fifties. From Mrs. Klingerman, quote. I'm still married to the same man I married at 19 and still marveling that my choice was so right. Uh, from our two children, there are four grandchildren, all brilliant and beautiful. So she's at least still publicly professing her untimely love for her husband. And then, I write fantasy probably because I have never outgrown the fearful fun of telling myself scary tales so long as it's broad daylight and there's a beloved grown-up close by to run to. You know, she sounds like the kid. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like the little girl mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. story. It does. It really it does. So, and they are such remarkably well-made stories. And, and at the best, very elegantly written. Uh, yeah. I mean, she, she knew how to construct. How to construct a sentence that simultaneously is a well-constructed sentence that tells us exactly what we need to know about the character at that moment. The thing I couldn't find was some reference to the little girl in the story where she's uh, talking about how frustrated she gets when the house gets up before she does because then she's running behind. And she has to already spend the day out. They have to struggle and then she, and she has to spend the rest of the day trying to catch up with uh, the rest of the house. And just little things like that. You know, this is this is the work of an adult woman who was married and had family and friends and knew people and paid attention to what to the people who were around her. And what comes through also for me is that she clearly liked people. <coughs> you know, I've read a lot of um, fiction from missing throats. Mm -hmm. And there's so much affection for her character that's shown through, even when she's making fun of it, like the um, the letters from, I forget Laura. Right. Letters from Laura. Yeah. You know, where the protagonist is basically, you know, this kind of a dopey girl who uh, gets mixed up with, with a guy she couldn't, shouldn't get mixed up with. It's a little time travel story. It's very, uh, very funny. Very it funny. is, but it's it funny, funny now. I mean, that's one of the ones yeah. that, that yeah. um, where, but it, like I say, the human all the way through is really mm -hmm. That, that was um, the one story that I really knew by Queen of beforehand because it was anthologized in, uh, well, Anthony Boucher and uh, Francis McComas um, had this massive two-volume anthology in the late 50s called The Treasury of Great Science Fiction, which was one of the selections for my first introductory package, the first time I joined the science fiction book club. And that study reprinted that story there. It is, it is a very, very funny story and of course, when I read it when I was like 12, it was like, oh, ha, ha, this is very clever. I recognized it. I reread that, and I'm like, damn, this is a really funny story. But it is also, by the time you get to the end of it, some very bad things happen. And the way that the woman deals with how the bad things have happened goes back to this notion of women embracing their own sexuality. I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. But it but is what I'm saying, that her. It's also dealt with this, this affection. Like mm -hmm. this, this is this is one of the cases where the woman clearly is not. We never think this. She's it's a self portrait. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and yet she's still she, she's not presenting this kind of shallow and sort of flighty young girl in any in any kind of bad light. Even if you might think the reader might think, wow, you know, she's kind of shallow. Right. But you don't ever get the sense from the author that 
you should dislike this person. Right, ruining the common sense. No, mm -hmm. no. And so it's, and that's I think why it, it is, has had more to offer you when you read it again as older, is that yeah. it's got more in there. There is more in there, and as I said, there is an unexpectedly um, unpleasant, I found, mm -hmm. if I'm reading it correctly, no, think, yeah, an yeah, unpleasant yeah. twist that she deals with in a quite striking way, and uh, it's a very funny and clever story. I mean, that one, and, you know, I, I guess if there's an inevitable question of what are your favorites uh, in there, I would say that one, the two stories that I think are the darkest ones, uh, the Wildwood, and a red heart and blue roses. I mean, that's uh, red heart and blue roses in particular is things getting into Shirley Jackson territory, and also the story Stair Trick, which is interesting because that is given to us primarily from a male perspective, and it is, uh, and again, it, it, it's a story. But it, that's where the affection for the character yeah. shows through because it pays off for him at the end. But that that's a really that's a hard kind of story, right? And, and, and she did it, I think, and she did it really, really well. Yeah, and that's one that I think has, a, I don't mean it, but I think that this, again, is not so much an autobiographical fact. Right. It's hard for me not to read this as part of her own, her own experience, yeah. is that she returns in these stories often just as an aside, or as a small moment, so it doesn't have much to do with the plot. Um, to this vision of, of, of a, a, a moment between two people where you, they, they immediately identify a sense of sympathy, of kindness, compassion, and embrace that you seem to feel like she herself must have had some of that kind of longing that she puts into these people because it's, it, the way she describes it repeatedly in different stories, it seems like it can't be an accident that this was something she imagined, whether she felt she once had it, that may have been the base of her marriage, or whether she just always wanted it. I, I, I inferred, I, I felt the same thing, but I inferred rightly or wrongly that she was probably really, very religious, and I felt like some of that came out of her religious background, just a like, yes on my part. But it seemed like she wanted to write about the good, the good in people, and you know, grace notes, and that was one of the things that spurred her into writing, I suspect. You know, it, I don't think any of the stories were overtly religious, except maybe the, um, the last prophet. Yeah, that's really interesting because we can't we can't always spoil it. All. Right. It has. It, it, it seemed to me at first to be like just not in a bad way, but outright religious. And this would be her one chance to glimpse. Yeah. Um, she got very close to it, but then there's a little part at the end where I don't know how to interpret it, but it seems like it flips it over a little bit. It doesn't simply accept the presented religious thing wholeheartedly. I'm not sure how to read it yet, but... Right, I think that... that I, I agree there's a... I'm trying to decide how much we should say about it. It's, it's another character portrait from a man, actually, right? Yes, it's a man. Kind of, kind of a, 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 a bore at parties. who's always telling people his theory. That's what I'm sorry. I was trying to be the way right. right now, but boring the way that's they leave before you can finish. In story. every discussion or every conversation, there's a a moment of dead silence, a big lull in the yeah. conversation. And he, his research has found that it's always 20 minutes after the hour. And he's traveled the world going to parties and he's a right. rich guy. And so he's got this where he spent his time, and he's got 12,000 something instances that he's traced where it's always at, at this. Once in a while, it's a 20 of. That's just because, like in anything else, nothing's perfect in the human world. But those are no 19 cases are obviously right. outliers. And he's trying to, he's gone on this quest to figure out why, how the book explain this, and he's gone and spoken. And he's talked to a lot of people who haven't had the time for him, naturally, as he sounds like a prey, until he finally finds two, two magi, that's right. Right, he goes and he yeah. gets the two magi from the east, and he gets ridiculed for that fact. One, at one point, he gets, the tap tells right, he's derailed because there's supposed to be three, yeah. and he's over to <laughs> finish. But one of them doesn't reveal the secret to it. And then that's what he's trying to tell people all these years, and only succeeds at the very end. Um, and that's where you find out what it was. And it, it does have a religious component to it. But it is, it, it, but even there, she does throw some things in that make it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not. It's not that you want. You have to. Right. 
It, it's not proselytizing for religion. It's not at all. Very good. Yeah. Packs a lot into a small space. Yeah. So she has these, these scenes between people, and like one of them is the minister of the portfolio. It's just establishing how, how she comes to trust so much these, obviously, aliens that she's met, these, this cute dad, very human, like she just takes them for Air Force officers. Okay. But she says, before she shut her eyes, Mrs. Criswell saw the love in George, and in that moment she knew how rarely she had seen this look anywhere, anytime. This is the kind of thing that comes up over and over. It's in it's in um, Star Trek and it's in um, it's in the uh, Green Velvet Cloak story, and so you feel like like I said, she's expressing a belief in something that exists that she wants to exist, in place, you know? and um, it plays a role like this in a lot of these stories of uh, almost a religious thing. It's almost a contact with the divine. Like you feel like the right. kind of love you want from God. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's actually a pretty good description, I think. Because it, it's not, it doesn't feel dogmatic, or it's definitely not uh, <coughs> written as espousing any one particular religion. But it does feel like it's part of her, her makeup as a person. And that it's one of the things she aspires to as a second person. <coughs> and that's why it comes to the fiction so clearly. And, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned Minister Without Portfolio because that was her first published story. It's also one of the most, maybe the most overtly science fictional yeah. story in there because I mean, it's a Black Saucer story and there it is in 1952. And uh, I, one thing I didn't look up was to remind myself of the career arc of the famous TV psychic Chris Wall. I know, I Chris Wall uh, Yeah, Chris and, um, Chris Wall. Yeah, for, uh, so, um, and, but again, you know, back to the idea of human decency that, uh, you know, the, the key fact is not the, that the aliens are there, but that they have, but that she winds up being their point of reference, you know, for and she is so decent, human racing, and she is so decent. Yeah, it is a shame. I don't know how these things worked back then, but retroactively, one would wish that. She had had an agent who might have thought to try to get in touch with Rod Serling. Well, she did have an agent. Yeah. Um, because, because these are perfect, right? Twilight's I mean, she, the first lull comes, I guess, a few years before before uh, the Twilight Zone mm -hmm. started, right? And she, she, the first lull is, is at 58. Yeah. And then she has a couple of new, new ones for. And that's the, well, as you said about it being one of the most overt uh, science fiction ones. It's called a cup full of space, but we all know how they used to do these things. Um, they thought that was the best way to sell things. And there's, there's maybe two stories that are strictly science fiction. Um, most of them are fantasy, yeah. um, and, and maybe a little bit horrific. Yeah, so, and uh, so, well, I think that the wild, again, the wild would again, the red heart of the world, so it's like, Okay. Also, in terms of her as a woman writer, just in terms of uh, the 50s context and all that, I was very amused by just the, the, how the book was uh, packaged. A cup full of space, <laughs> all right. a heady brew of science fiction stories, and on the back it says, recipe, yes. recommended ingredients, blend the above with bite on the beyond. Now cook over a little flame, yields an unmeasurable serving of pleasure. So the whole thing is thoroughly domesticated. And there is, in fact, one of the, one of the other say, overtly <laughs> science fictional stories here yes. called Winning Recipe. Right. Rec 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 winning Recipe. And that one's from, uh, that actually showed up in um, was the Collier story yeah. first. Yeah. That did kind of remind me of like those Heinlein stories that were the same you can call yeah. uh, you know, Housewife versus Machine. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's got a very, um, it's got a very, uh, accessible portrait of the mechanized future. So it's not one that you can see why it didn't have to appear in a science fiction magazine. And it was, yeah, it was the woman uh, wrestling ultimately with what they call the, the kitchen autocrat. The kitchen autocrat. Mm -hmm. Which could cook, cook yeah. anything and render her obsolete unless she could figure out a recipe to get the bed. Um, Very Jesse. Yeah, so oh, it, 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 yes, it, so you can see why it, it, she wasn't she knew she knew she wasn't developing some 
was more interesting to look at the future. She was just, again, doing what she right. did. Yeah, that, that was the thing. Um, Stark is a very typical story for the slicks. Yeah, that's right. You can see right away, right away, right there. But you can also see in the character stuff, why I messed up is the same thing again, too. Um, it wasn't only that, it was a lot of those stuff was worried about everyone. They didn't have much interesting for the science fiction audience. So, yeah. Another thing that the story we haven't talked about, that I think is one of the funnier ones, is the, um, the vaguely Lovecraftian stickney in the critic, mm -hmm. yeah. which um, it's uh, is that from a kid's point of view again? Um, it's it's yes. Well, it's from an old, from some of the now older remembering okay. who who most of their life here was on the farm in Oklahoma, which is where, where she was born. Right. It has a strange well on it that clearly has some kind of a monster in it. And they've always gotten by, the kids all learned early on, to um, toss it a chicken every now and then, keep everything fine. Um, but apparently one of the kids from the farm allowed to be a, um, a post-war poet who is lauded amongst the, uh, the Elliots and everybody else. Because she has great fun with him. And she <laughs> gives you one of his poems, and then the, the brief critical review of it by this, this critic who has shown up at the farm who wants to check out the surroundings that produced this tremendous poet. Yeah. And we read the poem, we can see it. It's obviously just this, this fractured memory of the kids, of this horrific farm situation because this is the one kid who refused to ever throw a chicken in. And, but the critic, of course, makes all this stuff out of it. And she has told this tremendous fun. So the, the, the poem is called Early Departure. And it says, and his, his name is also great, the wit Quinton Bottle. In the well, feathers, clothing, oily, wretched, the swirling, swelling, the voiceless yelling, all the down yonder, Infinitely pondering, fear blown the future, wafts one away, clackety trackety, don't forget to tip the porter. That's a little poem. Yes, that's a little poem. And, and what he had done is he decided to leave early, got a train, and left town. But Cecil Chumley, Chumley writes his review The discovery of this Bible poem found in his papers after his death. Should the opinion of this reviewer secure to wit Quinton Bottle's position as the most penetrating commentator on this age? Other poets have, it is true, commented in a minor key on the same theme, the inflated, ground-swelling trauma of man face to face with himself. But none has shown so much stature, poise, and peculiar excellence of craftsmanship. The well symbol, obviously the existentialist mirror image, combined with the shockingly distraught feathers impales one with one word, a vast social fallacy, man's flight wish exposed for what it is. <laughs> Floating and oily are magnificently playful examples of Bottle's expanding metaphor technique. The stark, wretched, uncoils like a naked snake to hiss us before we invoke the sensuous beauty of the swirling, swelling, alliteration being one of Bottle's most incremental effects, achieving a key, great density in a many-doored room. The voiceless yelling is a key passage. For sheer wantonness, this is unsurpassed. There is good meat and some lovely gristle in the next two lines. Here we discover unity imposed upon experience, demonstrating a powerful sense of self-involvement. The last line is a poignant prayer. That's, don't forget the tip. Right. <laughs> the porter. And so, somehow, she was exposed to this sort of thing. I hear you. So, you know, was she just by that point? I don't know. This is kind of early. It seems kind of early, but she certainly had had plenty of familiarity yeah. with what's going on. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. I, I just want to very quickly mention one other story uh, in here, and that is the story of the word, which is basically a kind of joke story. But I don't know if anybody remembers uh, the movie, Str uh, was it Strange Invaders? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, oh man, if, if that story, somebody involved with that movie read this story. That's all I've got. Yeah, they never remember it. Yeah. Was, no doubt. Yeah, because it's exactly the same class. Just exactly the same class. <laughs> and the little witch, I would say, is another one that's um, funny, but it's full of that kind of acute observation, I think. Yeah. Um, it's one of the most successful. People running out of time.
to it. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out the uh, some of the context for Stickney and the Critic is that this was written in the mid-1950s at a time when serious literary critics only noticed science fiction when they could attempt to trash it at great length. And Mildred Klingerman's punchline to the story, which probably isn't that much of a spoiler, is if anybody could swallow modern criticism, yeah. Stickney could. <laughs> no, it's the whole thing from, it even talks about, um, even gets a, a jab in the critics in describing how the narrator learns to read. Oh, beautiful, and, yeah. A beautiful so yeah, that whole, whole story, something got, got going, whether it's about science fiction, just about the impenetrability of academic writing at the time, and sometimes today. We'll go we'll find plenty of things like that right now. <laughs> um, so yeah, she just had that kind of delightful ability, and you sort you really wish that there were much more because that's one story, the only time that she goes anywhere near this stuff, and she does it all, and it's over. And you kind of, I found myself wondering at the end, thinking, well, what could we have had if she had if she'd written for thirty-five steady years or something? How much um, else? Would have been? Because her portraits are so nice, but. There's still, it's, it really is worth bringing it back, you know, the program or something for an award. No, 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 here, even with this little bit. No, the award was certainly richly deserved, and I commend the committee for uh, making that choice. And I do hope that uh, if the grandson is interested in pursuing it, that something can be done. Because, I mean, you could put all of these stories. Plus, if you found me, if you unpublished things, um, you know, in a decent sized single volume, and, and it, it would be a perfect um, project for uh, a university press or a uh, um, book yeah. yeah, or a pack of books. Yeah. So, like you said, it, it's a rare case, but it's really interesting that you have all, all the work and you just take. Yeah, fairly brief on it, and you go. Do Do we know? Is Does the player and family know that she won the award? Yes, they are. Yes. Yeah. So, sometimes you know, there you know, stories yeah, you know when to tell. I talked with Mark about him last year about the award. He was very happy. Uh, that's where he told me some of the, some more detail. Uh, I I thought I put Ellen in touch with him to get him to try to write something for this year's program book. But I guess that didn't happen. I don't think he's much of a writer, so I don't know if he's a writer. Is it? I think so. Okay. Yeah. But, um, and, and no, I mean, she's well worth discovering. And also, again, worth reading in the, in the context that, uh, oh, we only have five minutes, uh, okay. the, the uh, uh, context of Lisa's book on galactic suburbia. And, you know, think Truth, Merrill, uh, Carol M. Schwiller. I'll also mention, although I she's great. Right. I just see right, yeah. Um, and um, the, although she's later than the writers we just mentioned, uh, one of my favorites is also um, not well that well remembered these days is Sonia Gorman, uh, who also published a number of stories in FNSO. And uh, she actually had, Starman actually had one story called When I Was Miss Dow that was in the Norton Book of Science Fiction about her retrospective to the Korean War uh, and all of that. But again, just this very small body. Uh, of work that is really interesting stuff. So Dorman had a story in the book that was one of the nastiest, creepiest things. I think it was in the first one. Oh, uh, God, talk about male threat. <laughs> uh, are there any other uh, questions? No? So you want to just recommend a couple other things? Talk a little bit about the wild wood for seven year friends? Is that? Yeah. Well, as I said, this is about a, a, a woman who very much uh, is um, deeply passionate about her husband, but winds up on a an annual pilgrimage to get by a Christmas tree, but they wind up in this sort of seedy urban lot where there's this creepy guy. And uh, it's this one of these, uh, you know, I call the uh, Curiosity yeah, it's, 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 uh, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's there, there, sometimes it isn't there, but it turns into this family ritual. And basically, this woman is being stalked 
walked by this guy every year when they go there, and her husband is absolutely oblivious to what's going on. And then there's, and then it takes a sort of supernatural turn, and it's very much what the uh, the, the program was talking about with um, you know the being under a male threat, and the same thing with the red heart and uh, uh, the. The title of the two women in the hospital is talking about just the, the house guests that wouldn't be. You know, I, I thought that was so interesting to compare the uh, Stop Fitzgerald story with the uh, Kid Benjamin Butler. Yeah. 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 That's, that's true. That absolutely. Yeah. And she would have known that story. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm sure she would have known that story. But it's also yeah. interesting if you were to be more uh, do uh, to to me compare. The wild wood with letters from the wild. And then when you get right down to it, we're talking about exactly the same thing, but she's handling it in two radically different ways. So, yeah. uh, just to give you a sense of, of the, the whole different tone that she pulls off in there and how disturbing the wild wood is, um, at one moment, uh, on, on the first visit, this, the creepy owner of the Christmas tree lot. Also makes candies and he hands these things he'd seen her before yeah. and hands her this candy and she, she describes it this way sickeningly pink, loathsomely slick and hand filling. It would have been cleaner, more honest, she thought, if it had been a frank reproduction of what it was intended to suggest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, that, and it's really um, let's hope her husband did agree. I'm getting I'm getting, I'm getting <laughs> I just picked up, I have just picked up my program book before this panel. I had had a chance to look at it, but there's actually a piece on Mildred Klingerman in the program book by uh, Lucy S. Uh, oh. yes, uh, which I've not had a chance to read. So there's one before that from one of the family members. Oh, that's good. Yeah, from um, uh, 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 Randall Kendall Faye Burling hmm. or something. And there's, oh, uh, there's a marvelous photograph of Mildred Klingerman. In 1959. Yeah. 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 Yeah.